last time when I did this for you, I, I basically wrote it from the other direction. Now, what we, what we said we were going to do with this is say that the reason that birth can, that death can happen is because of birth. So we're going backwards. And some of this really needs to be changed a little bit. But I'll take you through it. Um, so we start out. Now, what will you say about birth? I just wonder. And I go, aha. Because there has been some contention over the years in Buddhism as to what the birth link actually means in the texts, perhaps we should clarify why there is a debate about this. We need to consider unlocking our minds when it comes to discussing dependent origination. This is part of the secret of freeing your mind and being able to change things in life. The truth is that this process isn't any different uh, than any other process suggested in the Buddha, Buddha Dhamma. Each topical group within the teaching has graduated levels of understanding. And if one only looks at dependent origination in terms of human lifetimes, it automatically becomes a theoretical issue that cannot be proven. It might be out of habit that we do this because of the tension and stress caused in us by the wrong concept of a personal perspective. We're, we're, press, we're stretching ourselves to have an I, a me, a my, a self. And we want to look at this in terms of just one human life to next. That's why we're doing that. And if you only think of it through a personal perspective, then it would certainly become logical to assume that the birth link always refers to the birth of a human being and nothing else. But this is too narrow thinking. What about the birth of the aggregates themselves, which could mean the repetitive origination and disappearance of feeling, perception, and thoughts and consciousness, for instance, throughout this life, that would, it would mean continuous uh, kanika jati and kanika marana, moment to moment, birth, moment to moment, death. You see, it would be birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, etc. Now, as you practice applying the instructions for the Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, tightly guided by the Buddha's own established approach for observation, the joint use of serenity and insight, samatha and vipassana, opens up a much wider internal view for deeper observation as a possibility here. So once you're familiar, we train to sense and see the arising of seven various obvious links while in or out of meditation. One can learn to sense the contact at one sense door, one consciousness, understand contact, and then notice the birth of one arising feeling and feel mind lock onto craving as it first begins mental proliferation follows and habitual tendency points become identifiable up to the link of the birth of an emotional reaction many, many times over. So this is the process we're always talking about, the line of how things are actually happening, okay? Now, abiding by the instructions for the meditation and followed far enough, we can realize a momentary shutdown of our perception, feeling, and consciousness as the system turns off and momentarily a sort of system reboot takes place as we come back online. Now, if one has been taught to identify the habitual tendency storehouse inside of us, then there is a momentary point where we can say, never mind, stopping the flow and choose a response action. Instead of accepting the usual knee jerk decision to react, that's coming from a library of the past. And this is something you can actually keep track of by keeping the little notebook. I try to tell people to do this if you never did it, even for two weeks, 
make a commitment to keep a little notebook of what's happening when you get upset or you, you disagree with somebody or you get angry or there's some sort of upsetting interaction at work. When you go home, just hang out with a drink of tea or something and just write down what happened and then read it. You read it and you see where the personal stuff was there. But what I want you to do is write down what happened, turn the page and then write it down again and catch yourself at every point you were taking things personally and write the story how it would have been if you were taking things impersonally, you see? That's the exercise. So this is the beginning of developmental cognizing instead of recognizing or repeating our entire life. The point is that this birth or jati link does not necessarily have to dictate, dictate to use reactions. We have a choice. This is volition, okay, in Buddhism. We can choose otherwise. So when investigating all of this, we don't have to be locked on into only one explanation referring to the birth of a human being. We can look at it in other perspective from another angle. To get to the real potential this practice is opening up for us, we have to unlock our minds and consider only whether uh, the genius of the Buddha stopped at one level of investigation or went for the real answer. I believe he went for the final truth. And this is why we have chosen to show you how to watch one phenomenological event at a time. First, before going deeper as you advance. If you go too fast without practicing as you move along, your mind cannot grasp, the, uh, grasp and adopt the new knowledge and experience of the truth. The fact is this approach to learning could be a major key from the original Buddhist practice, which allowed people to observe the entire scope of human cognition from the smallest microscopic operation to the largest macroscopic view, which is across lifetimes, and every event possible to happen in between. That's more like the Buddha. To me, that's more like the Buddha. Now, so once again, the middle way is what we're looking for. And viewing one event at a time seems to be right on track. So once you get this investigation going, it's, it's uh, then up to each of us how deeply we want to continue the observation, how much we want to use this practical, in a practical way, a practical approach to life. It turns out that the Buddha didn't teach dependent origination in the same way in every sutta. Partially, that is what caused some debates. He taught only the links needed to clear up understanding about particular subjects one at a time here and there through the text. So initially, most of us learn the 12 links, but it could only be five links in the sutta. Sometimes it was nine. Sometimes it was 11. Sometimes there were additional links added in that included a transcendental line of meditation development revealing 23 links. Now, incidentally, if you listen to Delson's talks, he's going to be talking about this, I think. Uh, some Oh, wait, no, no, I'm sorry. He's not going to be talking about this. He's going to talk about something else. Okay, the, bo the bottom line here is that dependent origination within the texts we were not uh, are not narrowly confined process within one length of time that's it's not there it's not defined that way and it is not a cut and dry teaching the buddha used the links to teach many things that encouraged persistent curiosity investigation experimentation deeper observation so as we develop our meditation, our internal observation lens gradually becomes stronger. This is your mindfulness. This is the actual observation part. 
becomes stronger and we are encouraged to go further in to take a closer look, but not tighter further in longer periods of sitting, but not tighter. This is encouraging knowledge and vision to occur. At the gross level, we see surface things. Some people are happy to accept this level of vision. They relieve stress and relax better after a work day and they sleep better. But there is deeper level of understanding the Buddha. And he challenged us to learn about that that is that it, in a very interesting way. There is more to realize than you think. And if one shifts around the angle of the internal observation, some useful things turn up to help us in daily life. So as I've told you in the past, the Buddha saw more deeply than any of us will see how things work. He went for more knowledge in the story of the leaves, you know, the leaves in your hand, if you've never heard it, they repeat this story in many funny ways. They repeat it like uh, the leaf story is uh, the monks are standing in the forest and they're looking around in when the leaves are falling, like right now, and they say, well, Lord, is all the knowledge that you have like all the leaves on the forest floor? And he pauses a moment and then he turns to them and he says, my knowledge is like all the leaves on the forest floor. But then he, he scoops up a, a handful of leaves and he says, but all that you need are the leaves in my hands. For this lifetime, this is all that you need. Because there's a number of reasons. Because why was my question. Uh, because why? Because he's there. Because he's the master. Because he's giving you the whole story so that you don't have to stumble around for years and years and years. He's giving you the fast way to get in and everything if you listen just specifically to him and keep practicing until it works the way he says it's going to work. Then you begin to understand when he was here, this was absolutely true. Of course, what we did a number of years ago when we first heard this story and we were on the mountain, the people on the group, on the Yahoo group said, well, how many leaves were in his hands? And then I said, yeah, well, that's not the problem. What kind of tree was it and how big were the leaves? So you're not looking at just how big a man he may have been compared to other men. They say he was a very big man, okay? but also with large hands. But you know, what if it was a willow tree and the leaves are the size of my, of my finger? You know, they're, they're the shape of my finger. He could be hundreds and hundreds of leaves in his hand. But what if it was a maple tree or an oak tree or what? And that's not reasonable, but if you come over here, I have leaves that are this big. There are leaves over here that I can sit on and float down a river on like Tarzan, you know? I saw some of those in Pune. I, can't, I got pictures of those and I just cracked up. I said, look, there's a Tarzan leaf, <laughs> you know, and then some beautiful leaves that are like this and they're all edges are just beautiful, you know, in the jungle. Um, so what kind of leaves were they? That's the question. How many were in their hands? And we started a thing called connecting the dots that went on for close to a year. And the first number we got was 63. The second one was 89. And the third one, I think, was 112. And someday I'll tell you about that. And I won't, don't go off here and tell you about it right now. But that the story about the leaves on the floor isn't just that story. There's another story where the monks are walking along the shore of a river. And um, they say, is your knowledge like all the grains of the sand on the side of the river? And he says, well, actually, the, the number of grains of sand that are in my fingernails here, that are in my, in my fingernails, how the gra granules of sand that are in my fingernails, this is all you need. He did it that way. And he said, you don't need all the grains of the sand on the Ganges, on the sides of the Ganges or something like that. You only need this much. So he, he found the answer, the final truth. He precisely left us instructions about the most difficult parts of meditation, and yet we persist in ignoring it. When you talk about the hindrances, it's a good example. We just in, insist on ignoring what he said, you know? But there are other parts of it that he gave us 
messages and told us specifically what to do. We just ignored it. You see. So the thing is, he's saying when you have the master, how many, how many, how many of the uh, sutras have you heard? Where the the issue is, the Buddha sits there in the beginning of the sutta. He tells the monks some information, valuable information. He makes a statement of a summary, you know, and then he get he waits a little while, and then he gets up and walks into his kuti, and then the monks say, "Well, we need to go find a Mahakachana to tell us what this means," because they let the Buddha get away. You have the Buddha. He's there right in the Majjhima Nikaya. You don't need to go anywhere else to learn what we're showing you. There, uh, there's only really one place I would send you, which is the Bojanga Samyutta, that section with Samyutta or the Nidana Samyutta for the dependent origination, because the Bojanga explains the final understanding about the enlightenment factors coming into alignment so that you can fall over into cessation, see? And then the other one, the Nidana, there's a lot of little things in there that unravels how you're supposed to teach dependent origination, why it was important, and lots of little things in there. There's 89 suttas just on dependent origination in that section. But you don't need to go through that whole book. You don't. We tell you only the necessary knowledge you have to have in foundation in order to take that and your practice and you're, you're, you're equipped to go on a long journey. So it's clear that he left us enough information to get off the wheel of suffering. And certainly along this journey, a reduction of suffering can happen here and now, even if we do not entirely succeed in stopping it forever. Having said this, the Buddhist presentation of human cognition which he called the impersonal process of dependent origination, is no exception to this rule. Therefore, we should be checking it out from all different angles of observation that are possible as we proceed to study it. And this means we can re-examine the links from different angles. So we especially can do this with the birth link by considering everyday events in life and keeping track of our actions and reactions, like I was saying to you, and we'll begin to see that pattern comes out. It evolves what I'm telling you. But the process is real, and even I can experience it at some level. And I say that's what, it's precisely my point. Most people can see it as it is demonstrated for them, to see them, uh, to see from a different angle. And therefore, I suggest that perhaps it's time to bring this process home and see how it can change people's lives. Now, what gets lost in all of this is the prime directive of the Buddha and his express request in, I'm not sure if this is the right Sutta number. When I went over this, I didn't have a chance to check because this 95 is chunky, but it says that this is what's in there. A student never blindly accepts what is handed down to them or told to them via an authority figure or tradition. This included himself, meaning the Buddha. They should be able to prove everything step by step through personal experience in their meditation, meaning knowledge and vision, which is evolving into knowledge and wisdom once you've seen it by direct knowledge. That, that's how you understood it. Once again, we see the Buddha advocating that we question everything, we test it, and we know something only through this knowledge and vision. This means knowing by directly seeing it. And this should become the guiding principle in our investigation. Every generation should keep on testing the practice. They should attempt to find the practice that successfully allows us to see and understand, that purifies and retrains the mind, that leads to clear understanding of the way things actually are. Okay, that would be the six R's, right? But what does this have to do with the link of birth in the process of cognition? I'm getting to that part, Q. <laughs> you see, if the practice doesn't lead you to that, then it falls within the realm of philosophy. And usually by consensus, believes that this 
inapplicable process of dependent origination flows across three lifetimes. It has very little to do with daily life. That's the problem. You or your soul do not personally move lifetime to lifetime. This idea is an eternalistic belief where your personal soul stays alive after you die and this unchanging self across lifetimes. There is an, un I'm sorry, there is an un un unchanging life that travels across lifetimes. This is totally unfounded. Now, which isn't Buddhist? He says, and that's right. You caught that. Good. Remember Sati, son of the fisherman in 38, and how he got caught in a vast trammel of suffering? Yes, the, the talk about Sati is presented by Bhante Vimala Ramsey on the online at the home site. You can go to Damasuka, you go to the library, look up Majima Nikaya number 38, and listen to it this week. It doesn't matter what version you listen to. He's one of the most consistent teachers in the world, probably. He's, I've been working with him for over 20 years, and he sounds exactly the same when he teaches it now as it did in 2005. Now, in that talk, the Buddha tried to get across that this same consciousness does not travel across lifetimes. The Buddha explained that this was a process outside of philosophy, and it had to do with practical, direct experience. Did he? Yes, he did. And we have to move away from the three lifetime chart to bring this entire process closer to home to really understand it. So you do this by changing the angle of your observation. Was that kind of a chart uh, right or wrong? Well, this is where it gets fun. You see, it could be considered wrong if you approach that chart across three physical lifetimes using the example of a human being. But at the same time, the chart could be perfectly correct if you were to shift into the impersonal perspective and change your angle of observation. So you have to be careful when you say it's it's absolutely wrong. It's really not totally wrong. You can look at the way they divided the chart up and you'll see what I mean. You have to play with it. I might need to take a picture of that chart and give it to you, I think. It's on the back page, the last page of the Vasudhi Maga book. How does this work? Well, in the case of dividing the 12 links across past, present, and future physical lifetimes, it gets very confusing. However, if one takes a moment to consider the word lifetime, this could expand the meaning exponentially of the same chart. If the meaning of the word lifetime included the lifetime of moments, seconds, cycles within thoughts, sights, sounds, events in life, one by one, well, now we have, must, may have something significant to work with now. And this could be useful in this very lifetime, because at this point, I don't think anyone can declare the chart to be wrong anymore. I changed my mind. <laughs> Perhaps when the chart was first formulated, it wasn't made clear that it wasn't supposed to be the only one that can be confined into one view. By considering the view of individual phenomenological events, which occurred during our life. It just means one phenomena arising at a time and logically watching how it operates. That's what that word means. We will open a new perspective of how the process could help us find more peace in everyday life. So this gets interesting. If we keep our minds open to possibilities, then things always get fascinating in Buddhism. Would you like to consider this further as we go more deeply into the training? I'm willing. What about now? Well, our most useful angle of observation should be seeing what is essential for clearly understanding events in daily life. If we can retrain mind to see clearly how anger, for instance, arises 
and operates or see clearly how depression arises and operates, then this would really help our world today. When we see with a stronger lens what is going on, often we let go of all the unessential parts of these events. And this sort of observation is very helpful. What you are saying then is that it, it, if you really want to understand something, don't contain, con, confine yourself to one viewpoint or angle of observation when you're investigating it. Exactly. Look at all parts. You're suggesting that I experiment with the definition of birth across a wider spectrum than just using the stock definition of a physical human body that's born into life. By doing this, it could help me to understand real life situations better. That's right. We need to find the definition that works effectively that will help us move towards more peaceful coexistence in the world. Let's not talk about peace here. Let's live peace. All of this is just an extension of the idea of gradual levels of training and gradual levels of development. These links can be looked at in this way and it is helpful for the meditation and it leads us to peaceful solutions in life. And we should keep doing this, keep going on with this. In the example of a woman who was working in the office, there was a very, this is very helpful for you to see what happened to her. Can you show me what that was? I'll try to explain it. Remember this, now you didn't have this because we went backwards this time, but there was a lady who had a problem in her office and she was gonna quit her job. So I'm just gonna jump through here. Um, okay, the discussion was there was a lady in an office who had an unhappy relationship with her manager and had to face him every Monday morning. Remember, it was happening over his reading the past weekly report. This is what it was based on. And actually, this is a true story. And she says, yes, okay. So if she, if she takes herself out of the picture and watches only what is essentially happening in this situation on each Monday morning, like seeing the frames of a movie, then perhaps she would see precisely how the suffering is happening for the manager and for herself, if she understood dependent origination. From the angle of observation, without emotional involvement, she would have the space to develop a creative response instead of reacting. Make sense? Okay, he says yes. Well, let's break down the event then in terms of the process of dependent origination. The lady observed her manager entering the room, picking up the weekly report off her desk and seeing it with his eye and realized that he made eye contact. The event continued onward. With eye contact as condition, a painful eye feeling arose. With this painful feeling as condition, craving arose and this revealed his personal dislike for the reported information. It made tension and tightness arise in his body and mind and then his I don't like it mind took this information personally and with craving as condition, clinging arose in him. His mind leaped into the stories, concepts, ideas, opinions about why he did not like this report. With clinging as condition, habitual emotional tendencies arose in him. He chose a card in his library of reactions. And then with that habitual tendency as condition, the birth of an action took place. Oh, there's the birth link. Exactly, right. But here we are considering the birth to be defined as the birth of the action in this individual event. Do you see this? Yeah, go on. So now action, according to the Buddha, is of three kinds. There is mental action, which consists of personal opinionated thoughts arising. 
there is verbal action, which can be verbalizing words of anger to someone or internally doing this. There is bodily action, which would be doing something physical and the body, like stamping with foot in the case of slamming the report on the desk in front of her. In this specific event, can we recap one more thing? Now, this observation works by seeing how she changed her perspective. Sure, let's look at it, the synopsis of the event. As observed from the angle of an impersonal perspective, she saw a man and he was standing in the doorway. It's actually her boss. He walks to her desk, he picks up the weekly report. He notices that he sees something. Eye contact has happened, and as she watches, she witnesses that a painful feeling arises while he reads it. He gets more anxious as he's obviously thinking about all the times he's read this Bloomin' report before, and she sees him craving with I don't like it mind and clinging, tensing him up with this extra thinking that's going on. And this becomes obvious by the shift of his body language. He very quickly chooses a habitual emotional re uh, tendency and crashes forth into the birth of action through the mental, verbal, and physical eruption of anger. He thinks in anxiety, he speaks in irritation, he physically motions his anger with a stamp of his foot and his distaste for the report. And finally, he is gone through the door into his own office and the event is over, at which point her blood pressure was always way up, okay? But wow, that played like a movie. Yeah, this is what I was trying to get her to understand. Life does seem like a movie. If you understand, that's a potentially a different way of looking at things. But what did you notice happening as she observed this time? And Q says she impersonally identified an individual frames of the movie. That's right. She shifted into an impersonal, non-judgmental observer of an event without being involved. She watched the event with the perspective of an audience. And after it happened, she realized she had not been upset by it. Her reaction faded away. Instead, she gained space for considering a response. And that is what changed. Can you summarize what she saw this time? She impersonally observed a man this time. The man saw something through contact with his eyes. A painful feeling came up, tension and craving. He did not like it at all. He latched onto thinking with clinging to thoughts and stories about why he didn't like it. And she saw him shift into deciding what to do for a brief nanosecond, checking out his habitual emotional tendency library as he reached in and took hold of the solution and gave birth to the same old reaction again. In the blink of her eye, he did this in the same old way. Finally, she noticed how frustrated he was having to deal with the report and how all of this was impersonal and seemed to happen for them both so fast. But then what did she do? She contemplated the situation, decided that next Monday she'd attempt to, to activate a solution. She thought about next time and planned that before he had a chance to react emotionally, she would skillfully invite him to have a cup of coffee with her and discuss a way that they could both create another form of report that might benefit both of them. When she does this, she will be force playing a different response out of him without him having a chance to react one more time, eh? Yes, and she will opt for a creative, peaceful solution. And this leads her to peaceful coexistence through activating a compassionate, creative solution. So she's giving birth to that. 
space opened up for a meeting of the minds, so to speak, and brought about the creation of a new, more useful workplace. How did it go with this woman's situation? Well, actually, she kept her job and everything improved in the office environment. She became more useful for him in the office and he was happier and more supportive with her at work. So both people in this situation do not have to be practicing like this in order for positive change to come about. That's right. This is an interesting point about dependent origination, especially in relationships. Only one person has to learn in order for the whole relationship to change. Remember, we can't change people. We can only change ourselves. But what you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future, if you remember that too. That is one of the points that is interesting. It only takes one person to understand what is actually going on concerning the cognitive process to bring about change. Both people don't have to understand the impersonal process of dependent origination. When it becomes clear to one person how things work and they stop taking things personally, reactions cease and everything changes. So all personal doubt and fear in this situation end for the person with this knowledge and vision. Compassion can arise when parties begin to get what they actually need. This impersonal perspective is what opens the way for exhibiting compassion in action, allowing the growth of altruism. Usually both parties can get free from war and realize peaceful coexistence. How? Well, it was knowledge that set her free, wasn't it? Was it her own knowledge and vision that helped here? Yeah, it was. And she learned by hearing from a guiding teacher. Then she practiced herself and saw what needed to be done. Then she realized what can happen. It was in this way she acted from a foundation for peace. And it worked. Her knowledge and vision shifted into knowledge and wisdom in action. She, was, she saw the links for real. She didn't just know them anymore. She internalized them. She went and used them and experienced it for herself. And it happens very fast, didn't it? And I said extremely, and it did. The entire event included all three kinds of action happening in a fraction of a second as the information reached the manager's brain when he read the report and his cognition flowed to the link of habitual emotional tendency. He thought something, said something, and did something physical. So fast it looked like it all happened together. Anyway, you get the idea. And after this link, what happens? Exactly. We witness the suffering with, while the process is happening. And at that point, a combination of things happen, which are symptoms of the suffering in detail. And this will be discussed in the next link.